So hello everybody. Keep uh, getting pizza. Actually, pizza doesn't have any even on milk. Rarer and more precious commodity, given our current state of affairs. So eat up. Uh, but uh, we're going to get started because we actually have a very rare and precious commodity here, which is John Sherman. Um, only thing I'll say by a little bit of background, just for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Wilkins. I'm the faculty director of the Center on the Legal Profession. This is our speaker series. I hope that some of you have been coming all year, and we'd love to see as many of you as possible for all future events. But you're not going to go to one that's in some ways more important than what we're going to hear from now. And I'll, and I'll just say uh, this is a subject that I think when John first started, maybe people will tell you thought it was sort of an oxymoron. I don't know, Robert's social responsibility, human rights, how do those things go together? Then it was kind of a, a niche thing, and he and uh, John Ruggie were pushing the boulder up the hill. Um, now it's really become a big topic of conversation. And uh, as a center, we sponsored an event at the International Bar Association where it was just a small roundtable event. Uh, for some general counsels and some uh, managing partners, in which we talk about value, and we talk about value in two ways. One is what's the value of lawyers to their clients, and the second is what's the value of lawyers to society. And I knew the first one was going to be a rich discussion, because lawyers and clients have been having this discussion now very uh, candidly. But the second one, in many ways, was even uh, richer. And uh, we had the general counsel of uh, Nestle, who said this was one of the most important issues on the US agenda. We had the uh, general counsel of the UN Global Compact. We had uh, managing partners uh, from around the world who said this is the thing that's moving to the top of my agenda. So uh, there's nobody that knows more about it than John Sherman. He's the general counsel and senior advisor of SHIFT, which is a, a great organization we'll talk about. He was there at the beginning with John Ruggie when these, the whole idea of kind of the UN Global Compact and this way of thinking about professional responsibility got off the ground. Uh, we've known each other for uh, a long time and we're absolutely thrilled that we could finally get our dates together where John uh, could come and speak. So uh, you didn't come uh, to hear me and you didn't come just to eat pizza, so John Ruggie. <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone. Um, David, uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak here. And this is something of a favor because it's a very important uh, paper that the Center for the Legal Profession uh, wrote. Uh, David was a co-author in 2015 that uh, really has helped to advance the ball uh, for the legal profession uh, with respect to business and human rights. Um, so let me start. Uh, I am uh, a recovering uh, corporate lawyer. Uh, <laughs> for the last decade, however, my specialty has been business and, and human rights. And I was a core member of the UN team uh, of special representative to the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, uh, who was a Harvard Kennedy School and a Harvard Law School professor uh, named John Ruggie. And we helped him shape and draft the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which have become the authoritative global standard uh, on this subject. And after that, I helped uh, Professor Ruggie and uh, other uh, team colleagues uh, set up SHIFT, uh, which is a nonprofit uh, independent organization headquartered in New York. Uh, and it is the leading center on business and human rights uh, expertise and learning. Uh, and SHIFT works with businesses, governments, other institutions, including law firms and law societies uh, and in-house counsel departments uh, to implement the guiding principles. And I'm, uh, I focus on our work with, uh, uh, with the legal profession. So what I want to talk about today are three things. First, the background, the uh, uh, content and the uptake of the guiding principles. Second, the guidance that the International Bar Association has issued uh, for, for lawyers on the subject. And third, the potential opportunities that the guiding, uh, guiding principles in legal practice may be uh, offering to uh, uh, younger lawyers like yourselves. So let's, let's tell you how I got here. 
Um, after graduating from the law school in 1972, I clerked for a federal judge, worked in a Boston law firm, and then in 1979, uh, joined the legal department of a regional electric utility, then called New England Electric System. They were acquired uh, in 2000 by National Grid, which was a UK-based uh, international energy company. Now, I was hired basically to, to head their litigation effort, but I became a jack-of-all-trades, uh, acquiring uh, experience in power plant and electric transmission line licensing and environmental law and enterprise risk management and, and uh, uh, corporate ethics and compliance. Now, when National Grid acquired New England Electric System, my, uh, my own practice took an international turn. Um, at that time, National Grid was building electric uh, transmission lines all over the world, um, including in developing countries. Uh, it, it saw and wanted to avoid the kinds of problems that other infrastructure development uh, companies were, were running into, and those included violent conflicts with uh, communities uh, uh, which had threatened the sustainability of their projects. Now that was symptomatic of a broader issue. Since the 1990s, globalization uh, has helped to uh, reduce poverty and, uh, in emerging economies and increased welfare in the industrialized world, but due to the lack of capacity uh, in individual national governments to uh, deal with these impacts, uh, the path of globalization uh, led uh, to uh, human rights problems in its wake. Three emblematic cases, uh, the discovery of child labor in Nike's uh, supply chain in Southeast Asia, the death of thousands uh, from the uh, explosion of Union Carbide's pesticide uh, plant in Bhopal, India, and the Nigerian military's hanging of uh, Ken Sarawiwa and eight others for protesting uh, Shell's uh, exploration activities uh, in uh, that country. Now, not only did uh, human rights problems like these harm people, of course, uh, but it was becoming increasingly clear that in addition to potential legal liability, Involvement, company involvement uh, in these uh, uh, crises harmed uh, th themselves. And, and you see it in the, uh, through such uh, factors as boycotts, strikes, delays in getting uh, projects online or goods to market, divestments, brand erosion, uh, reduced access to capital markets, and ultimately the loss of a political uh, social uh, and legal licenses to operate. So the initial, resp the initial response of many companies was, uh, not my problem. So I didn't, I didn't do this. Uh, go, go, talk to, go talk to the supplier, but not mine. Or, uh, you know, maybe let's just hand this over to our defense lawyers and they'll deal with it in court. So the UN was looked, uh, looked to for guidance, but frankly, it didn't make very much progress. In 2003, a UN subcommittee uh, submitted to the UN Commission on Human Rights a treaty-like document called the Norms and the Responsibilities of Transactional, uh, Transnational Companies. And it would have imposed on companies uh, within their sphere of influence the same obligations that states had uh, under treaties that they had ratified. This got absolutely nowhere. NGOs loved it. Businesses and trade associations hated it, uh, and, and, and states, you know, they, they, were, you know, they didn't, were nowhere to be found. So what happened? The wires got wrapped around the axle at the United Nations, uh, and uh, finally in 2005, uh, Kofi Annan uh, asked, uh, uh, who was then the UN Secretary General, asked uh, Professor John Ruggie to serve as his uh, special representative on business and human rights to uh, uh, unwrap and untangle the wires. Now, Ruggie was a former uh, UN Assistant uh, Secretary General for Strategic Planning, uh, but he had uh, uh, gone back to academia. 
and ended up uh, at Harvard at the Kennedy School for the Center of Business and Government. Um, Kofi asked him to design a, a framework that would outline the respective responsibilities of states and businesses on human rights. And he said yes, thinking this would be a one or two project. It ended up uh, taking six years and involved uh, uh, dozens of consultations, a lot of research and pilot projects over the world. Now, going back to National Grid, National Grid, who was thinking about these issues seriously, uh, in, in fact, in, in trying to, to invest in developing economies, decided to jump into the debate. And it became a founding member of about a dozen uh, multinational uh, businesses to support uh, Professor Ruggie's mandate, um, called the Business Leaders Initiative on Human Rights. And I lobbied very hard to represent National Grid uh, on this group, and my, I tell you, my boss was quite skeptical, uh, and he said, "Okay, I'll let you. I'll let you do this under one condition: you be the adult in the room, and don't, you know, don't don't make any promises that we can't uh, deliver." Now, unfortunately, he wasn't a very good judge of character <laughs> because I went native. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I worked, started to work very closely with, with John Ruggie uh, and, his, and his, his brilliant UN mandate team, most of whom were 30 years younger than me. And I was very pleased and surprised to find that my experience as a corporate lawyer uh, was highly relevant because it helped us translate uh, uh, human rights into terms that businesses and lawyers could understand. Now, in fact, uh, Professor Ruggie has written that corporate lawyers were among the most consequential new players that he invited into the uh, business and human rights uh, debate. Um, why? Because they had influence with the corporate C-suite. He learned this the hard way. Marty Lipton, uh, who is the head of the Wall Street firm Wachtell, uh, Lipton, Rosen, and Kantz, wrote a public letter uh, warning them that Professor Ruggie was seeking to impose unprecedented uh, duties on corporate boards. So we engaged with him, and after a while, uh, Mr. Lipton turned around 180 degrees, and he, he wrote another client letter a year or two later, concluding that the guiding principles provided a valuable new tool to enable corporate boards to oversee and monitor uh, the, the management of, uh, of uh, human rights risks. So when I retired from National Grid in 2008, I joined Professor Ruggie's team full time and became a senior fellow at the Center for Business and Government at the Kennedy School. Now, I now want to get into the guiding principles. Uh, after all of this work, the guiding principles were submitted to the uh, UN uh, Human Rights Council, which was the successor to the UN Commission on Human Rights, and it, it unanimously endorsed the guiding principles in June in 2011. That was the occasion of a couple of firsts. It was the first guidance that the council or its predecessor uh, had issued on the respective obligations of states and human rights, and it was the first time that either body had endorsed a normative text on any subject that they did not negotiate themselves. And the, the endorsement was unanimous. Now, what are human rights? I have a lot of detail on this slide, but boiled down, and I won't go through it, but boiled down they mean that all persons have an inherent right as human beings to be treated with dignity. And Professor Ruggie's research showed that uh, businesses have the capability of affecting all human rights. Um, and you can look at any one of these, but the authoritative uh, list of, of, of core human rights is contained in the uh, universal, uh, in the International Bill of, of Human Rights, which consists of the uh, 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the main <coughs> instruments uh, through which uh, it's been codified, namely the uh, two uh, conventions in 19. Uh, 66, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the, and the uh, uh, Covenant on uh, Economic, uh, Social and Cultural Rights combined with the core principles uh, on, on uh, uh, 
uh, rights at work uh, issued by the International Labor Organization. So what are, <coughs> so now we're going into the content of the guiding principles. There are three pillars. The first pillar on the left uh, is the state's duty to protect human rights um, based on existing international law and requires states to protect against human rights harm by business through adjudication, through investigation, through legislation. The second, the middle pillar, is the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. And that is, companies should not infringe on human rights uh, in their own operations and critically in their uh, business <coughs> relationships. This is based not on law per se, but on minimum global expectations of how businesses uh, should behave. And it requires uh, that all businesses should have a high level uh, policy commitment uh, to respect human rights that's embedded deep in the organization, that they'll develop and implement human rights due diligence processes, and I'll describe that quickly in a minute, and that they will have processes in place to remedy human, human rights harm that they've caused or contributed to. The third and, uh, pillar on the right is the remedy pillar, and that requires states to provide effective remedy, both judicial and non-judicial, uh, for those who are harmed by business-related uh, human rights abuse. And it, in addition, businesses should establish operational level grievance mechanisms to enable them to spot problems before they accumulate and concretize. I want to talk about the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, because that's the one that's, I think, most important for uh, uh, lawyers and, and, and business clients, um, and sometimes overlooked. Uh, the guiding principles uh, do not uh, impose new legal obligations on business, uh, but they don't exist in a law-free zone either. Um, the laws of many company, uh, countries already require companies to respect human rights, and they're, they're in fields uh, such as safety and environment and anti-discrimination, uh, to name just a few. Um, in fact, compliance with the law is a bedrock principle of the corporate responsibility to respect, uh, but local laws may not be sufficient uh, to protect human rights. Uh, they may not <coughs> exist. Uh, with respect to each right, or they may exist and not be enforced, or they may even be in tension. Um, and in, the, in this case, the responsibility to respect requires uh, that uh, companies uh, to, to uh, respect human rights over and above compliance with domestic law. And that's designed to prevent companies from racing to the bottom, for example, by choosing to do business uh, in countries uh, with uh, poor workplace uh, protection in order to take advantage of, of lower costs. Uh, another key point is that respecting human rights is not a voluntary uh, sign-up standard. It exists whether or not you, as a company, have an explicit obligation. And finally, it um, uh, can't be offset by philanthropy. Um, it's about how a company behaves when it's earning its money. It's not about how much of a percentage uh, of its profits it gives to charity. So it isn't satisfied in a law firm, for example, by pro bono. Now, talking very quickly about human rights due diligence, it's a four-step process. You have to assess uh, uh, risks. You have to respond to it in an integrated fashion. You have to communicate, you have to uh, track your performance and communicate it. Um, and this is all done from the perspective of the rights holder. Um, the focus is on harm to people, not on harm to companies. It's not, it's not a, a pure cost benefit analysis, but experience has shown the more severe the risks to people, uh, the more harm there is to companies. Now, a company can become involved in uh, uh, human rights uh, harm in one of three ways. Uh, first, it can cause an impact by itself. Second, uh, whoops. Second, it can contribute in parallel with, with another, uh, such as by 
um, polluting drinking water uh, with another company or, or through a business relationship, such as uh, sourcing products from suppliers who abuse their workforce. And third, it can be directly linked to an impact that it neither caused or contributed to. That is, making a product that ends up being used to abuse uh, human rights. Um, and this is a very detailed slide, uh, which I, I, I won't take too much time on. But the response that a company uh, ought to take depends upon its mode of involvement in the harm. If the company causes or contributes to harm with a third party, the company is expected to prevent or mitigate the harm, use or increase its leverage with the other party to uh, mitigate the impact and contribute to remedy for the harm to the extent of its cause or contribution. However, if it is, doesn't cause or contribute to the, to the harm, but is, uh, it's, it's directly linked to it by its own operations, it's expected to use or increase its leverage to seek to prevent the harm, but it isn't, doesn't have to contribute to remedy. Now, the uptake uh, is uh, of the uh, uh, UN guiding principles has been quite swift. According to the uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I'm quoting, the guiding principles of the authoritative uh, global standard providing a blueprint for the steps that all states and businesses should take to uphold human rights. Um, and this slide lists uh, key international institutions that have embraced the guiding principles. Um, and they are increasingly reflected uh, in law and regulation, in public policy, in global <laughs> issue and industry specific uh, standards and the practice of companies uh, and in the advocacy of civil society. Now, as I said earlier, uh, Professor Ruggie's mandate attracted the attention of the corporate bar. Um, it was initially skeptical, but later became supportive. Uh, and corporate lawyers around the world uh, helped uh, to explore the uh, legal implications of respecting human rights, creating, helping to shape due diligence, the remedy pillar, uh, and piloting, uh, piloting projects. But from the legal profession's perspective, general counsel were, were, were the key drivers. They are typically on the front line in every company when human rights uh, issues come up. They don't call up their outside counsel, they, they call in the general counsel. And as a result, in, in some leading companies, it is the general counsel that leads on human rights. And even where it doesn't lead, the general counsel office plays a key role uh, in shaping how a company implements uh, its human rights responsibilities. Um, they assess national and local frameworks, uh, they, they draft contracts that add to, to a, uh, a company's leverage. Now, the interest of the general counsel predictably sparked an interest by law firms uh, to, to you know, help them understand these issues. And a number of major practice groups uh, have already set up uh, or are setting up business and human rights uh, practice groups and leveraging their existing expertise in M&A, litigation, uh, you name it. And younger lawyers have played a key role in this, which I'll come to later. Um, bar associations, uh, for their part, uh, began to show a very strong interest in the guiding principles in order to meet the demands from their uh, members for guidance. The ABA endorsed the guiding principles in 2012. The Law Society of England and Wales set up uh, a, uh, uh, a business and human rights advisory group uh, in uh, 2013, the Japanese Federation of Bar Associations issued a, guide, a guidance on human rights due diligence last year. But as the international voice of the legal profession, uh, the International Bar Association has unique uh, convening authority. It consists of 40,000 individual members and its governing uh, body consists of 200 bar associations and law societies around the world. Now, I joined the IBA in 2006 and ultimately became co-chair of its CSR committee. Um, and the IBA became very supportive of, of, of the mandate. In 2013, the IBA 
uh, created a working group to draft guidance for the uh, uh, for uh, for its members, and I was asked to chair the group. And we ultimately had uh, a working group uh, consisting of uh, 12 lawyers uh, from all around the world. And needless to say, the consultation process within the IBA generated a very robust dispute because we have lawyers from common law, civil law systems, and different cultures. But ultimately, we came to, to the same place. In 2015, the IBA uh, issued a, uh, a guidance for bar associations, and then uh, earlier this year issued a practical guide uh, for, for lawyers, which is kind of a high-level guidance for, for people who want to get into the subject generally. By the end of this month, um, the working group is going to issue a comprehensive uh, reference annex, uh, which is going to uh, go into the, uh, these issues in, in uh, uh, significant detail. So I'd like to now talk about what the IBA is, is doing by first identifying the, the legal practice areas that, that are affected by the guiding principles, the implications uh, of the guiding principles for the independence of lawyers, and then finally exploring the uh, challenges that the guiding principles present. Uh, for lawyers uh, in law firms and uh, uh, inside councils. Now, the legal practice uh, areas that are affected by the guiding principles, I've listed uh, four here. There may be, there are many more, just to give you a flavor of them. Litigation is, of course, the first thing that lawyers talk about uh, when human rights are raised, and that's appropriate, but I won't get into that in any detail except to note that there's a recent uh, law review article by uh, Notre Dame professor uh, Doug Castle, who's, who is arguing that human rights due diligence uh, can establish the basis for a common law duty of care uh, owed by companies to external stakeholders. And he would say that um, that would include a duty of care owed by a parent to uh, villagers uh, injured by security forces protecting uh, a mine operated by its subsidiary in another country. I won't try to sort out the pros and cons of that argument, but I would note that there is some resonance between human rights due diligence and the common law duty of care theories, but there's no one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, human rights due diligence was intended to be a highly flexible uh, process to enable companies to manage uh, their human rights risks. It wasn't uh, intended uh, to be merely a sword or a shield to be yielded by litigants in a courtroom. But, you know, just stay tuned and see what happens. Now, turning to corporate governance and risk management, uh, remember I, I talked about Marty Lipton and how he felt that it was, uh, that the guiding principles were a great risk management tool. That's become even more true today given the uptake of the guiding principles. Reporting and disclosure is uh, another area where to date there has been a huge amount of uh, legislation and regulation uh, all around the world uh, requiring companies to uh, report on their human rights impacts, some as part of general sustainability uh, uh, and, uh, uh, reporting and others with respect to uh, specific issues such as uh, modern, uh, such as human trafficking. And, uh, and slavery. Contracts and agreements, another key area, that's a key source of leverage uh, that, that companies can use. Um, to give you one example, uh, earlier this uh, year, uh, last year in July, FIFA, the World Football Association, uh, announced that as a prominent part of, the, of its new reforms, and gosh, they were needed, <laughs> that they would require all of their contract partners and their suppliers to adhere to the guiding principles. Now, FIFA encompasses 209 national associations and 300 million active participants in the world. Um, so it, it's got some global reach. And as a result, this announcement is causing lawyers all around the world to scramble to say, what on earth do the guiding principles mean? Because it's going to be in my contract that I have to sign. Um, and that shows that I think that the guiding principles uh, are adding significant uh, human rights punch to the private law of contracts, uh, which is creating, uh, some would say, a new 
Lex Mercatoria of Human Rights. Now the big issue that the IBA debated uh, in deciding what to do about the guiding principles was the concept of legal independence. Um, and it has at least two dimensions. The first dimension is independence from external pressure. Uh, uh, and the second one is independence in the advice provided. Now, there is a, on the first, uh, there is a, a, a UN convention, a UN uh, 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 report in 1990, uh, which uh, in Havana, which said that uh, lawyers should not be identified with their clients or their clients' causes. And that rule comes out of the criminal defense context. Uh, uh, it's been applied where governments have harassed lawyers for representing uh, uh, disfavored persons or prisoners in politically sensitive cases. Um, as a result, uh, what this means is that uh, a, a, a client, including a business, has a right to demand uh, and if retained, a lawyer has an obligation to provide a ro robust legal defense uh, to allegations that a client uh, uh, violated human rights. And, and that, that obligation can't be uh, abridged, uh, even if the client is highly unpopular. But the second dimension of legal independence is the need uh, for lawyers to be prepared, when appropriate, to give independent and candid uh, advice that goes beyond the black letter of the law. Uh, on critical external consensual issues, including the global consensus on human rights that has become the guiding principles. I said earlier that the guiding principles are not limited by local law. They, they expect a company will respect human rights whether or not uh, they are required or permitted to do so by local law. Um, and this uh, 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 means that it's quite relevant for lawyers to be prepared to advise on the guiding principles uh, as, as important context. Otherwise, uh, if, the, if a deal blows up, the client's going to be very unhappy with the lawyer for, for having said nothing. Now, when a lawyer uh, provides that kind of contextual advice on soft law norms, uh, he or she is acting not only as a technical legal expert on the law's nuts and bolts, but also as a wise counselor uh, who advises the client uh, not only on what is legal, but what is right and fair in the business uh, uh, and serves the business interest so that the client can decide what to do. And here I'm, I'm paraphrasing the superb paper that David, uh, Ben Heinemann, and William Lee uh, wrote uh, called Lawyers as Professionals and as Citizens. And it was a highly valuable way for us to frame the issue at the International Bar Association. But that doesn't you know, end the story because there are, are, are issues for business lawyers. Um, there's always problems when you're doing new things. Um, the first is a lack of clarity on soft law norms and what do they mean. Hopefully the guiding principles will shed some light on that. And then secondly, and interestingly, law firms and, and general counsel's offices don't have the expertise. They don't really know about this human rights stuff. Um, that's going to change over time, but, but it's a current gap. And third, the client uh, uh, may uh, seek advice uh, only on very narrow, technical, nuts and bolts issues. In that case, it's, kinda, it's very useful to provide the client with a sense of the big picture. Now, going to law firms. Uh, law firms have their own responsibility uh, as business organizations to respect human rights. Responsibility, as defined in the guiding principles, extends to all businesses, and there's no exception for professional associations. Um, and law firms are big business worldwide. Uh, they were reported to have 2015 revenues of, of uh, $92.7 billion. So applying the guiding principles uh, uh, to law firms is straightforward uh, when we're talking about the employment practices and their operations, their supply chains. But um, lawyers and law firms can also become, in human, uh, become involved in human rights uh, uh, problems of their clients. And I, I've listed a bunch of them on this slide. Um, they're inspired by real life cases, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just describe one. 
it's the first, and it involves a, a high-level official of an impoverished uh, uh, African country who also headed the uh, country's uh, state-owned lumber business. And he siphoned off tens of millions of dollars from that business and hired a law firm in the United States, actually two law firms with each one was, had no more than two or three people, to launder money through firm accounts and dummy corporations that the, uh, uh, that the firm had set up. Now you may remember a video uh, of a global witness sting of 12 New York law firms uh, and it was featured on 60 Minutes and you can still see it on YouTube. I, I highly recommend it. Um, uh, and it's, it's, so, so, so law firms themselves are not, are not immune from, from this, uh, uh, from getting involved. Now, applying the, the responsibility to uh, respect to, to law firms requires uh, special attention since law firms uh, play a key role in upholding the rule of law and the administration of justice, which is, of course, bedrock to the UN guiding principles. Um, so I've listed here uh, a number of things that law firms need to think about, and I can go over, go over them, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about one of them, and it's, it's, it's the debate over what leverage should mean in the context of the attorney-client relationship. Remember I said that leverage is the thing that you do uh, with your business relationship if you, when you find them involved in a uh, human rights problem. Now it's one thing to point out uh, to the client the business case uh, for respecting human rights in a particular transaction. It's another thing uh, to attempt to persuade the client uh, if it disagrees. The former is providing advice about context. The latter uh, is substituting the lawyer's uh, moral judgment for the client's. Uh, so, and we've gone through these kinds of careful balancings in, in each aspect of the, uh, of the practical uh, guide. So I want to uh, conclude by uh, returning to the expertise gap that I mentioned a little earlier. This is a brand new, new area for uh, lawyers. It isn't part of the uh, uh, standard uh, uh, business lawyer's toolkit when you get issued, when you go to spend your first day at the law firm. Lawyers don't feel comfortable advising about things that they don't know about, and so they tend to stick with the things that they know. Firms that are assembling business and human rights practice groups have observed and I've observed that it's the younger lawyers uh, in the firm who are actually providing the expertise and the energy. Um, for example, this one major international firm, if I said it, you would all recognize it. Um, the impetus for creating a business and human rights practice group came from younger lawyers in the firm who were surveyed as to the areas that they wanted uh, to, uh, uh, to, to develop. So they got together, and that was not easy because this was an international firm, but they managed to convince a couple of uh, practice head leaders um, to uh, create a group, leveraging the group's experience in uh, ABC, which is anti-corruption, anti-money laundering, bribery and corruption, and M&A, uh, and now they have a, now they just issued a big report. But the pattern of having, you know, having the senior partners come forward and you see their names on the website, you look underneath and there's a junior lawyer somewhere out there who's doing all the work, who knows all this stuff, and they're constantly asking him or her what they're supposed to do. So in the field of business and human rights, it's often uh, the junior associate who brings more value to the firm uh, and its client than the senior partner does. So keep that in mind. I hope maybe that, that you can be one of them. Um, so that, that concludes my, my talk. Before we get into, into questions, I have a whole bunch of, if, if you really are a glutton for punishment, I have a whole bunch of readings, uh, which, <laughs> uh, just to show that I wasn't making this up. Okay, so anyway. We'll make those a bit, yeah. John. It's okay, we can make of those course. slides available yeah. for people who want to learn more, because there's a lot of great stuff in Please. Okay, please. Floor is open for questions. questions. 
Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, I've, I've been practicing for uh, a couple of years, and uh, I believe that you you are well aware of the guy that sometimes uh, CEO, uh, sometimes associate, or even partners are you know, stuck in a dilemma where the clients like a, a big one of the big clients asks ask the law firm to defend them against a, a violation. Say, uh, just for example, like Apple asks us to defend them in a trial level yeah. allegation. And that may be against our own moral or sense mm -hmm. of justice. Mm -hmm. uh, so in your experience, how do you cope with that situation? Yeah. That, you know, at the same time, you can uh, maintain a relationship with a client, which is a big one. And also at the same time, defend your own moral yeah. uh, sense of justice. Well, that's a, that's a great question, and I believe me, I've been there. Um, I was a litigator for, for many years, and I've had, you know, not that I had uh, problems with the company I worked for, but was very distressed about the impacts uh, that, that it had in personal injury uh, cases, which is what I did an awful lot of. I think that two things. One is that, you know, as the rule of law um, requires uh, that if somebody is accused uh, of a civil or criminal act that they uh, are entitled to a uh, robust defense within the limits of the law. The flip side of that is that there you are with a client and you also you act as the client's advisor. You, as a litigator you're, you are advising the client from the day that he or she walks in the door to to the day that the case is over and beyond. Um, you have the ability to say, okay, here's a problem, but you know, there are ways to avoid it. There are ways to mitigate it. And as an advisor, you can always tell the client, well, okay, we understand that you have uh, a claim that needs to be defended. Have you also considered the possibility of settlement? Uh, settlement in a way that allows you to engage uh, with, uh, with the rights holder. You know, because in every, in every claim, there's always by somebody, companies have, the, have the, the tendency to circle the wagons, but there's always a kernel of truth to, to mix the metaphors that, that, you know, that, that is there in the litigation. So you're constantly balancing the client's obligation to a robust defense and your knowledge uh, of the potential risks that the client has in getting into these situations in the first place. Inside lawyers tend to see this issue with more clarity than outside lawyers who tend to be uh, uh, retained for just, just for defense. But as an inside lawyer, I had to be aware of both sides. It's an excellent question. Can I see? Yes, sir. All right, thank you so much for the talk. So you mentioned that in the early 2000s when the global norms were developed, uh, governments were nowhere to be found. So it was mo mostly a tussle between civil society and uh, the corporates. Right. So I want to um, get your thinking on the role in place of governments when it comes to enforcing human rights in the corporate world, particularly at national level. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a, a, a good question because it raises the issue of, uh, you know, are we ever going to have a binding treaty on business and human rights that, you know, that, that will just sort of end this kind of uh, patchwork uh, uh, enforcement of human rights by states and by, uh, by businesses and, and multi, uh, multilateral institutions. And, and I think, well, first of all, there is an initiative to um, uh, uh, before the United Nations to try to develop a binding human rights treaty. The trouble is that it takes forever. And it takes, you know, we're looking 25, 30 years before we'll ever get a treaty. So the, the question is, what do we do in the meantime? The guiding principles were based on a concept of uh, poly polycentric governance, which means that um, standards and governance uh, breaks on, on corporations comes from many different sources. It can come from laws, but it can also come from standards and norms. It can come from contracts, like 
like the FIFA contract, many different sources. So while we may all want in the future a binding treaty, we've got to face the question, what do we do in the meantime? And, and that's kind of where John, I think... it's even more than that, because yeah. I remember talking to John Reggie about this years ago, and the problem was with treaties that they bind states, mm. but they don't bind private actors. And so what John was trying to do at the very beginning of the Global Compact was to say, what could we do that at least engages, if not attempts to bind, at least by their own commitments, private actors. And if we think that the bounds between the public and the private are blurring, and that more and more power in the world is being you know, moved through the actions of big global multinational corporations, that even if we got states involved, that we'd still want to have something that operated at the level of private decision making, which is why the law firms thing to me is so Interesting, you can see the companies, okay, they're already engaged in global, but now it's reaching the level of the advisors of the company yeah. and what their responsibilities are. Anyway. Yeah, and just, just, just to feed off of that point, which is a good one, what's unique about what the IBA is doing um, in its guidance is focusing on the advisor. Nobody's done that. Nobody's this is the it. first time that anybody has looked at the role of the advisor from a business and human rights standpoint. Yeah. I was uh, I find it kind of curious and, and interesting, especially for us in this room, how this the, the, the notion of the guiding principles seems to have moved a lot of business from from basically uh, CSR consultants, non lawyers, to to law firms. And so, I, do you think that law firms they would they would probably support uh, something more binding because this this provides more and more business. As, as <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, I, th I think the thing about law firms is that the guiding principles present a tremendous opportunity for them. So you can say, well, this is a lot of marketing stuff for firms. On the other hand, if law firms themselves have their own responsibility to respect human rights and provide, and provide advice on how firms can get out of trouble, well, that, that, may be, that may be another way. It's, that's one of the reasons why we, we talked about the practice areas and then talked about the responsibility of, of law firms to, to basically say, look, you're all in this together. The goal is to avoid human rights problems and, uh, and, and being flexible and behaving like a lawyer, not just a nuts and bolts technician, but a wise counselor. That's not necessarily consistent with being, you know, an advocate of, of binding, binding uh, principles. Any? Yeah. Yes, sir. So I'll get to you, sir. Yeah. You. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, in terms, you mentioned earlier that some of the earlier versions um, had support from NGOs uh, and no support at all from from, from right. corporate boards from, from corporate lawyers initially. Um, <coughs> How have major human rights NGOs, human rights advocates, used these principles um, to put pressure on, on companies who have potentially been involved in, say, aiding and abetting human rights crimes? I think if you go on the websites of the major uh, international NGOs, uh, you will see a huge number, most of them, uh, when they do launch their campaigns against companies, uh, holding companies to account for not uh, adhering to the guiding principles, so it is a very, very, it's become a very useful uh, tool for them. Yes, sir. Thanks. I'm talking about the capacity building. About? Capacity. Yes. Capacity. And then the key players in the industry. Uh, one of the things I found with human rights um, curriculum most times is very flexible. So I'm wondering, among the key stakeholders, I didn't hear anything about the, academ the academia. So I mean, there is a who bring that in to be able to help facilitate the capacity. Well, that's a good point. I mean, here we are, and you know, we're at Harvard Law School, for gosh sakes. Um, this is uh, the place uh, one would think that. Um, Develop young lawyers would learn about business and human rights as part of their corporate uh, legal curriculum. But I've talked to professors and deans of law schools all around the world, and that's rather rare. 
<laughs> so you're absolutely right to point it out. It is something that needs to be on the agenda, not only of, um, not only of businesses, not only of law firms, uh, but also law schools. And not just in the human rights curriculum, yeah. but in the <coughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, again, one of the things that's going to drive that is to the extent that it becomes a part of contracting, a part of due diligence, a part of regulation, et cetera. Yes, ma'am. So the guidelines talk about uh, corporate responsibility. And in my understanding, that, that that is different from corporate social responsibility. Is there, is there the guidelines at any time or uh, well, we, we've been pretty careful to make clear that um, this is a baseline responsibility, uh, not a uh, not a market driven. I think one of the critiques of corporate social responsibility is that it's a market driven exercise by companies. We will pay attention to human rights if it does something good for us, if it helps us with the, with our customers. The guiding principles say this is the baseline responsibility. So this is not corporate social responsibility. It is corporate responsibility. Um, so that's, that's the difference. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we focus on mainly the violations by corporations here. But uh, law firms also, they don't necessarily offer really good conditions sometimes yeah. in terms of Working, working conditions. And when I checked the uh, Global Compact website last year, I've seen a lot of law firms which doesn't have a really good reputation in terms of working conditions. So You're absolutely right. How, how law firms should address you know, these small kind of violations within the Well, sometimes they're small, sometimes they're not small. Um, you can find uh, in, in law firms supply chains some very egregious working conditions. Um, in their employment practices, you can find uh, failure, you know, failure respect uh, uh, family uh, obligations. What we did strategically in the development of the uh, practical guide was to say absolutely yes, these problems occur uh, in a law firm standard operations, but they, but there's nothing unique about, about that. Um, they're, they're the same as any other business. So we spent all of our, most, all of our time focusing on uh, the client relationships. But you're absolutely right, you can't ignore them. Uh, yes? Yes, I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit on your thoughts about when does respecting human rights or for start to cost too much? Well, I th I, that's, that's, that's always an issue, and, and I think that to the extent that you can tie it to the firm's delivery of services and not have it be just a, a pro bono something extra that you do, um, that will sort itself out. Because this is really designed for law firms to be, be part of the toolkit. If you see a client that's, that's about to complete a transaction in a foreign country, acquire title for a mine, and it turns out that, 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 that the community doesn't, will not respect its legal title, then you can take that, that tool off the shelf and say, look, you've got to pay attention to human rights. That's something you can bill for. Now, if the client doesn't want you to, to provide that advice, I'm that sorry, can be I'm sorry, yeah. my question. I'm, I'm thinking when it starts to cost too much for the, for the firm, Itself. Even yeah. the company. Yeah, you said firm. Yeah. When it costs too yeah, much. I'm sorry, I mean firm as in the enterprise. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not the law firm, the enterprise. When, when, when does it start to cost too much? Well, that, I mean, I think that for, for shareholders, that's uh, the issue is whether or not you're looking at short term risk versus medium term risk versus long term risk. Risk costs you money. And, and I think the evidence is that the risk. Uh, Short-term risk is hard to deal with from a human rights standpoint, but um, when you're involved in medium to long-term risk, severe harm to people and harm to companies tends to coincide. If you're a company that faces uh, the potential for involvement in rape, torture, murder, then that's going to be something that will come back to bite you in the medium and, 
and, and long term. And one other question. Yeah. So you mentioned that there was a working group formed with the IDA. Yep. Which yep. Well, I think we, one, of the, one of the things that we've done at the IBA is to issue a guidance for bar associations. And one of the things we've asked bar associations to do is to look closely at their legal uh, professional standards of conduct to make sure that they're in harmony with um, business and human rights. The ABA, interestingly, has, has a very important rule uh, uh, which says that uh, lawyers should be encouraged to give independent and candid advice because advice purely on the law may, uh, not, be, may be of uh, not sufficient value. So, but I think your, your question's a good one. So. Well, thank you very much, okay. Tom. It's uh, just about time. So, uh, another round of applause for John.